This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the course of the hour, we'll run through the business news stories you need to know about from the continent and beyond. But first, a run through the market. Starting off North Egypt, 30 continues its decline from the tail end of February. Today's 1.9% fall, taking it down to 6.7% in the red so far this year. The top four cities, the JC, still powering ahead, up 14.2% off today's session. Mining majors, BHP and Anglo American, accounting for the bulk of the index moves today. We'll be speaking about Coinbase's listing in just a moment. But generally speaking, 2021 is not bad for US markets. NASDAQ is up at least 8% so far this year. The S&P 500 the Dow Jones Industrial Average, both over 10% higher. But how can Coinbase justify that near $100 billion valuation? We'll explore that shortly. First, the headlines. The largest US cryptocurrency exchange makes a landmark listing at the Nasdaq. Egypt impounds the cargo vessel ever given over $900 million in compensation for blocking the Suez Canal. And South Korea heads to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea over Japan's plans to release nuclear waste water. So then let's start the program tonight with a look at the landmark listing of Coinbase Global on the Nasdaq, the San Francisco-based company is the largest American cryptocurrency exchange. It's the first major crypto company, in fact, to go public. It will start trading on the 14th of April with an initial valuation of just about 100 or so billion dollars under the ticker COIN, C-O-I-N. It has opted to go public through a direct listing rather than a traditional IPO process. In fact, at the reference price, Coinbase will have a valuation of roughly 65 $0.3 billion on a fully diluted basis. It lists roughly 50 cryptocurrencies for trading. There are 43 million verified Coinbase users in 2020, with 2.8 million of those making transactions every month. Its revenue more than doubled to $1.3 billion just last year. All right, then, so let's get an update from New York where this listing is taking place. John Terrace joins us now live on the program. Um, John, what sort of market reaction are you seeing to Coinbase finally going public? Well, you know, Rama, it rather depends on your point of view here on Wall Street, to be perfectly honest with you. It is certainly a talking point. Everybody on Wall Street is talking about the appearance of this major disruptor coming out of California and now playing in the big leagues here on Wall Street. And some people wonder whether it's come too early. We, of course, only time will tell. We're just going to have to wait and see. But the thing is that it is what you might think of as a stock exchange for cryptocurrencies. It was formed back in 2012, so it's kind of eight or nine years old now. It's based in San Francisco. And as you rightly say, Rama, it is the first crypto-related company to come to public markets, certainly in the United States, and I think actually anywhere in the world. Now, to evangelicals, which is my way of describing the people who've been banging on about cryptocurrencies for the best part of the last 10 years and who've been ignored by people like me for the best part of the last 10 years, for this, for them, this is a kind of coming out party. This is a very, very huge day. It's a very, very big celebration because they believe in this stuff. They really believe in cryptocurrencies and they believe in this stock exchange which has been created, which has now floated at the NASDAQ. So for them, it's very good. But for every person that is an evangelical, I have to say there are people who are still very, very skeptical of cryptocurrencies generally and this particular IPO generally. And they see very real downsides to the whole issue of cryptocurrencies going forward. And I think the key thing that they worry about is that they're not really backed by anything. You know, gold is gold, and an American government bond is a bond essentially backed by the entire country. But these things are really, when it comes down to it, just websites. And also, this particular company, Coinbase, they deal mainly in Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
and there are many other cryptocurrencies out there that they tend not to concentrate on. So that's something that concerns people a little bit as well. Rama? Indeed, we'll get to the concentration risk a little later, but let, let's go over the bones of the business, right? The, the user base did go up by over a third last year, over 43 million people. Revenues up by over 140% to $1.3 billion. It swung from a loss yep. in 2019 to profit that year. The numbers, at least in that period of time, look good, but isn't most of its business US focused or does it have a much wider reach? Well, I think it has potentially a much wider reach. I mean, certainly the most of the business I think is probably US focused, certainly at the moment. But of course, there's the wider potential for people around the world to invest in the company. But beyond that, I think that the evangelicals who are so keen on cryptocurrencies and this Coinbase company see enormous potential for reform. And this is where Africa comes in, in particular. I think there's huge potential in Africa, or at least it is said that there's huge potential in Africa. Now they talk about the, the growth of their business, which is why they're happy with the valuation of $100 billion, which other people call ridiculous. And that may even go higher now as a result of the IPO happening. But it's really the possibility of global financial reform that excites those people who stand behind this idea. Now, it, it is already being used. Cryptocurrencies are being used in Africa at the moment. I think one of the things that they do is that they protect against currency devaluation. You, when you use cryptocurrencies, you don't have to pay charges or you don't have to pay as many charges as you might do if you're actually transferring money. There's no longer any need with a crypto to buy dollars, for example. And with remittances, which of course is particularly important for Africa and Latin America, particularly in Africa, there is a report which came out towards the end of the year by a company called Chain Analysis which shows that remittances to Africa are up 55% as of June last year, so almost a year ago, at $316 million. And um, I, I think that this is something that is potentially quite important for Africa. And it's also important if you live in an African country and you don't have easy access to banks or the financial structure in your company country is a little bit unstable. I think that helps as well. And, and cryptocurrencies, what those in favor of them say, that they help to erase the bottlenecks that build up when governments and regulators get in the way. So I think for Africa, it may not happen next year or the year after, but the potential moving forward is quite great. Indeed, and of course, Nigeria has an interesting development on that front, an interesting battle playing out there between the regulators around Bitcoin. But speaking of Bitcoin, the firm did point out that the bulk of its revenue is basically just concentrated around transactions on two particular asset classes, Bitcoin and Ethereum. So how comfortable are institutional buyers with that kind of concentration risk? Well, I think that's one of the reasons why things are so volatile here on Wall Street today and why there are equal numbers of people who seem in favor of cryptocurrencies and Coinbase uh, and those who are prepared to speak against them. And this is one of the key issues. The company Coinbase deals mainly in Bitcoin, which I think accounts for 50 percent of all cryptocurrencies in the world at the moment anyway. And by the way, Bitcoin has been shooting up because of this IPO. It also deals with Ethereum, which is a cryptocurrency being talked up by the likes of Mark Cuban, who is a well-known businessman here, he owns the Dallas Mavericks basketball team, and also the likes of Elon Musk as well. But that is only two of them. And those who are against the idea of crypto say, well, look, OK, Bitcoin's on a tear at the moment, right? It's way above $63,000 per Bitcoin. But what did it do in 2018, for example? How much was Bitcoin up in 2018? And the evangelicals take a look at the numbers and they say, ah, oh, well, actually, it was down 75% in 2018. Ah, exactly, say those who are against the idea. Exactly. In other words, it's a very, very volatile, very, very risky situation that we have at the moment. And it could all end tomorrow. And this is where the argument of the, the Bitcoins and cryptocurrencies not being backed by anything comes in because, you know, there's, there's nothing really backing them up. It is, is, in many ways, a fad, an idea. and We're going to have to see how it plays out. And, you know, Coinbase coming to market certainly puts them in the big leagues. But can they stay there? That's the question.
indeed. Um, one last question for you, John. So, so last year, Coinbase had to suspend trading in, in XRP yes, after the, the associated firm Ripple was charged with essentially an unregistered right. securities offering. But what does that incident, generally speaking, tell us about how regulators and markets, uh, marketplaces rather, like Coinbase, are dealing with regulatory risk? Because this seems to be a very fast-moving, fast-evolving story. Well, I think that's the point. I mean, you've summed it up beautifully there. That's exactly right. It's a fast moving, fast paced story. We don't really, many of us know what we're getting into. I mean, the problem is with this is that many people, certainly older people like me, thank you very much, don't really understand the whole crypto thing. You know, it's very much a young person's thing. And that's, that's you know, a big problem as well. The XRP story, XRP is a crypto thing, you know, backed by and made by a company called Ripple Labs. And the issue, basically, they're rowing with the leading regulator here, the SEC, over various things that they may or may not have done. And it's in the courts at the moment. But it, this is the point. It points towards potentially more regulation and more government interference in Bitcoin. Now, we already know that Janet Yellen, who is the US Treasury Secretary, has said many times that she's not in favor of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. She links them time and again to illicit money, terrorist money, that sort of stuff. Now, if governments and regulators around the world, in Africa, let's take Africa as an example, where presently none of the governments, I think, are really regulating any of this. You mentioned the Nigeria story, I understand. But essentially, Bitcoin in Africa and cryptocurrency in Africa is unregulated. Now, we've talked about the benefits potentially for Africa going forward. If the regulators get involved, if the government gets involved and those bottlenecks start coming back in again, as they are in the regular financial system, well, is that going to kill off the enthusiasm for Bitcoin in Africa with this huge growth potential and also around the world? And that is why people simply don't know whether they should invest in this or not. Now, can I just leave you with this? We thought the trade in this company, Coinbase, would begin at $250. It came out in the end, about an hour ago, at the NASDAQ, at $381, so massively above where we thought it would open. And it's already up 50 or 60%. I don't know what that means, but I'll leave you with that. Indeed, at those levels, I believe it's, it's valued a bit more than even uh, the, new, the company, the parent company, rather, that owns the New York stock market. John Terrett in New York, thank you very much. Now, on to Ethiopia. The Ethiopian Communications Authority has yet again extended the deadline for operators bidding for new operating licenses. Bids are now required by the 26th of April. The authorities say the decision was taken in response to requests from bidders for more time to finalize their offers in light of how the pandemic has changed market conditions. Here's Angela Coppola with the latest on the bidding process. The initial tender request was issued at the end of November. The Ethiopian Communications Authority confirmed it had received those extension requests after the initial deadline of 5 March because it wasn't met by several key international mobile network operators. The regulator says that it had initially received expressions from nine telecom and two non-telecom operators. Analysts say that in South Africa, MTN will bid for one of the licenses and the other South African heavyweight Vodacom are also likely to have declared an interest in a license. We understand that MTN will be bidding directly, while Vodacom and Vodafone, in fact, will be bidding through their Kenyan subsidiary Safaricom. It's understood that Orange, the French mobile network operator and a part of French Telecom, is also interested. Airtel, in the meantime, has withdrawn from the process and China's sharing mobile may well still submit a bid. The regulator also announced that there are plans to sell a 45% stake in Ethio Telecom, the 100-year-old state of monopoly. The Ethiopian government have also announced that this is part of the plans to liberalize the sector almost three years ago is when it was first announced as part of the telecom sector reforms. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Chinese data out this week shows a strong recovery in its international trade. Both imports and export volumes rose significantly in March compared to 2020 and 2019, despite the pandemic. As the UTN Sumitra Naidu now explores, these numbers are particularly encouraging for economies here on the continent because China is a continent's largest single trading partner. 2020 was a dismal year for the global economy. Almost every major economy contracted. China managed a narrow escape, recording 2.6% growth for the year. 
Even though COVID is still present, China seems to be back on track. China was the, the only major economy that grew um, during the COVID ravaged 2020 year of over 2%. China's growth forecast this year could may even reach 8%. The clearly the global economy is, I would argue, Asia-led, with China being at its center. Chinese exports in March came in 30.6% higher in dollar terms compared to last year. It was slightly below analyst expectations, but still a strong number. China's trade surplus dropped to just under $14 billion as imports climbed 38%, much higher than was expected. That is a good indication for us as a country which exports to China because we will benefit from strong Chinese demand. It is also good news for the global economy. China is one of the large economies in the world. When Chinese goods are flowing, we tend to see global activity also picking up because countries that trade a lot with China do benefit from that higher volumes. Last year, trade between China and Africa fell for the first time in 16 years. A 14% decline was recorded in the first three months of 2020. But the trade data coming out of China does suggest that it is leading a global economic recovery. China's robust growth certainly underpins the growth story trajectory of many economies, particularly those that export. The export focus is predominantly commodities. That's talking about Africa. So China's very strong recovery rebound uh, dare I use the word post COVID 19, it's undoubtedly good news for commodity exporting economies. And it seems the trade relationship between the United States and China is also back on track. In March, China's imports from the United States rose by 75% to $17.29 billion, while exports rose by 53% to $38.66 billion. US dollars. Samit Renado, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. On to logistics, Dubai's DP World. It's one of the world's largest single port operators. It's seeking about $210 million in damages from the government of Djibouti in an ongoing legal battle over port concession rights. Now, DP World has been locked in this dispute with Djibouti, very publicly so, since 2012. It centers on the port operator's concession to operate the Durali container terminal. Djibouti sees this terminal in 2018, the London Court of International Arbitration has since ruled that DP World's concession to run the terminal is legal and binding. It's ordered that it be restored. DP World is now seeking damages for the estimated loss of revenue and management fees from 2018 to the 31st of March this year. All right, then let's start our company news wrap in the world of retail. The retailer Pepco, formerly Steinhoff Africa Retail, says the conditions for the purchase of properties from subsidiaries of its larger shareholder, Steinhoff International, have been met. Now, the retailer said in December that subsidiaries Ultimo Properties and JD Electronics had agreed to take over properties and leases for about 300 and for about rather 73, my apologies, 73 million dollars. Conditions that needed to be met included approval from competition authorities and consent from Steinhoff's creditors. In East Africa, Absa Bank Kenya has launched an asset management arm to extend fund and wealth management services for its clients. The new offerings will be rolled out in three phases, including institutional, retail and high net worth propositions. The announcement comes after the bank has given a green light from both the Capital Markets Authority and the Retirement Benefits Authority. Uganda-based fintech firm Numida has secured $2.3 million in seed funding in a round led by MFS Africa. The fintech plans to utilize the funding to expand in Uganda and to pilot its product offering in a new market, preferably in West Africa, particularly Ghana. Numida also plans to introduce additional financial services like payments, microinsurance and deposits to its clients. And finally, Toshiba's CEO Nobuaki Kurumatani has resigned ahead of the Japanese company's report takeover. Toshiba has received a $20 billion takeover bid from CBC Capital Partners just last week, a company that the former CEO has worked out previously. Kurumatani will be effectively replaced at this point by Satoshi Sunakawa, who led the company before the 63-year-old and until April the 13th was the firm's chairman. That's a run through your company headline. You're watching Global Business Africa. There's plenty more content coming up. We'll see you in 60 seconds. The world economy as we know it is about to change. 
Global Business Reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business, only on CGTN. Every story starts out like this. Okay. We'll Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible? And why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Sutra Hello, Nairobi. This well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. There is more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just, say, Table Mountain, or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place and make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Welcome back to the program. Let's head up north to Egypt. The Suez Canal Authority over there has provisionally impounded the giant ever given container ship, which had blocked the canal for nearly a week, pending payment of roughly $900 million in compensation for losses incurred as a result of that particular blockage. Now, the figure apparently covers the cost of refloating and maintaining that skyscraper sized vessel, and it's under an order issued by the Ismailia Economic Court. The Panama-flagged MV Ever Given, which is a carrying cargo worth more than $3.5 billion, is an interesting vessel. It's owned by a Japanese firm, Shoei Kisen, but it's operated by a Taiwanese entity, Evergreen Marine Corporation. On top of that, it's flagged in Panama. Now, the claim by the SEA does not include a salvage firm hired to rescue the vessel, it says, whose owners and their Highlander writers expect to receive their compensation separately. All right, then let's get the latest on this particular legal row. Adele Mahruki is in Cairo with more details on this. So, Adele, the Suez Canal is looking for compensation, but how is this $900 million arrived at? Give us a breakdown. So 914, and the breakdown is quite vague, actually, and this is what has upset um, the um, Japanese owner uh, of the ship. Um, the basically, uh, according to um, Shoei Kinsen, the Japanese owner, is that um, the Suez Canal Authority is requesting um, roughly uh, $300 million in salvation bonus, which is a maritime um, trend, if you may, for any efforts to rescue a ship without um, damage. And in that case, this is what the Suez Canal Authority has been widely um, um, announcing or marketing for, that the Ever Given was refloated without any damage, without oil spits, and so far it seems to have intact bodies. So it saved a lot uh, for um, the company itself. That's the Suez Canal argument. Also, there are about $300 million uh, 
other $300 million requested in uh, quote unquote reputation damage caused to the Suez Canal uh, Authority. That's in addition um, to um, the economic repercussions of blocking the Suez Canal for six continuous days for the um, uh, pollution reported with, with the 400 plus ships stuck on both ends of the Suez Canal and as well as the loss in um, services provided to ships that go through the canal on every day. So that's roughly how um, it is being presented. No actual precise details, Rama, on what or what is each uh, point. For example, how much did one tugboat cost um, the Suez Canal or is at least what, how much the Suez Canal is asking for each of the 14 uh, plus tugboats and the dredgers that worked in the canal day and night for six days to refloat the Ever Given. Okay, so the Ever Given, though, is, is an interesting legal creature, for lack of a better word. It's owned by a company from Japan. The operator, however, is from Taiwan. That's a completely different entity. So is, is the SEA suing both companies or just one of them? Who's, who's getting the bill here? So basically, the, 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 the specific case that we're talking about, the court case in Ismailia Economic um, Court, uh, which is a, a dedicated court for economic issues, um, it is only concerned, first of all, it's a domestic court case. This is not an international case. It's concerned with the ship itself, the ever given. So any negotiations happening with the rest of this complicated tie of companies and nationalities involved is just part of the negotiations rather than the legal uh, battle here. So this is the ship itself and this is why the ship has been impounded legally by um, the the court order it is very unlikely to, um, uh, to there isn't any confirmation but it's not likely that there has been any representation for the defense the ship's representatives whether that's it, it is japan uh, panama or um, taiwan um, were in the court and therefore this um, sentence of impounding and asking for 914 million dollars uh, in fines that's probably the maximum sentence this this is the first and initial uh, verdict in this case, Rama. And in Egyptian courts, uh, there is a v a numerous levels uh, of uh, arbitration. And therefore, it is very likely if these entities decide to appeal in Egyptian courts, that this figure will definitely drop. Okay, so the ship's owners and operators, though, could argue that, you know, there were high winds at that particular point in time. The reports we saw had uh, wind speeds of up to 40 knots that buffeted the vessel. They're blaming that uh, for its grounding on the right side of the channel. What's the counter argument to that high winds narrative by the SEA? So the Suez Canal Authority says that 40 knots of wind is a bit high or above average, but it's not an extreme case and it's not something um, that would alone cause um, the grounding of the ship. This has been um, the key uh, point to stress on from the Suez Canal side throughout the investigations um, period. That was of course accompanied by a sandstorm which decreased visibility. Another thing that the Suez Canal Authority said it is not exclusively um, the weather conditions were not exclusively the conditions for the grounding. Um, based on um, the Suez Canal um, narrative that whatever happens to the ship this is the sole responsibility of the captain on board there is a Suez Canal guide who goes on uh, board the ship to guide um, the captain and his crew throughout the canal but he is part of this captain's uh, leadership and therefore they believe that the captain the team operating or uh, navigating the ever given are the sole uh, responsible entity or uh, these this is the only person to point the finger at basically uh, with when anything goes wrong Th what is going on now is that they're ha they're analyzing the communication that has been going with the captain and the uh, nearby um, uh, communication fields they have the uh, data uh, for the ship that is being under the investigation as well and we're expecting to see the results by the end of this week Okay, and, and that actually does lead me to my next question because the SEA, yes, has, has impounded this vessel on the basis of, of the, the court order from the Ismailia court. But when this investigation into the root causes of that grounding, that's not been finished yet, has it? Yes, definitely. Um, nothing has been announced yet in that regard as in uh, what exactly happened, what was the wrongdoing of the captain as per se. Uh, but we know, um, according to unnamed sources from the Suez Canal, that they will be um, releasing um, the details of the investigation once it concludes by the end uh, of this week. And this, of course, will definitely uh, give um, a lot of explanations to how things unfolded and therefore will also 
point some fingers at who else could be um, responsible. We know that the Suez Canal Authority is in negotiations with the Japanese owner, the Taiwanese operator, the Evergreen that, o that operates the Ever Given. And of course, the uh, protection and indemnity um, club in UK called PNI, which is the insurer that will, at the end of the day, be paying someone something. So this is how simple, basically, it could be until we have solid figure about what went wrong exactly. Then all of these, the rest of the conclusions, the exact compensation and who will be getting it will be clear. Indeed, that's going to be an interesting bill to see once it finally does come. Adel Mahruki in Cairo, thank you very much. Now, we are still, of course, in Egypt. The smartphone market in the North African economy has seen some pretty healthy growth in 2020, despite the economic slump caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the latest data from IDC, smartphone sales in the country were up 10.6% year-on-year to 12 million units. Here's Yasser Kim with that story from Cairo. Wael Shaban sells smartphones in his shop that's tucked in one of Egypt's capital's bustling streets. He says 2020 saw a significant increase in sales of smartphones in spite of the economic fallout from the novel coronavirus pandemic. Because everyone is staying at home, everyone is trying to kill time by going online while others are working online from home. To keep up with the latest apps and services, many people have had to upgrade their old phones and buy new smartphones, which has then raised their sales. According to the International Data Corporation Worldwide Report, there are nearly 12 million smartphones that were sold in Egypt in 2020. Samsung has been leading with 25% market share, but Chinese smartphones are quickly catching up. Chinese mobile phones are in high demand because of the variety on offer. There is a variety in price, a variety in options, and they all have good quality for the market. Oppo, Samsung, Huawei and Realme have the highest sales. Experts say the market is witnessing a shift since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic as people reduce physical interactions and embrace digital transactions. Because of the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, people are not able to meet like they used to before. So all their dealings are done through the mobile phone. Naturally, sales increased. In addition, there are new models introduced every few months with more options to attract clients. Egypt's latest digital transformation drive has had its positive effect as well. Every state service now is through an app that you have to download. For example, paying electricity and water bills is now through smartphones. It has become a necessity in everyday life. Experts believe 2021 will see further sales increase as more people and services go online. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. Now, Egypt and China have signed an agreement to locally produce COVID-19 vaccines. The Cairo-based government vaccination arm, Vaxera, as it's more commonly known, is leading an alliance of Egyptian pharmaceuticals to plan to produce some 80 million vaccine doses a year in collaboration with China's Sinovac. The aim is to make Egypt a regional hub for vaccine production. Here's Egyptian's Adel Mahruki with the details. Vaccine cooperation between Egypt and China is reaching new heights. Egyptian Health Minister Hele Zaid announced the signing of an agreement with China's giant pharmaceutical Sinovac to produce COVID-19 vaccines domestically. The Prime Minister's office and the Egyptian president have approved the joint production agreement with the Chinese company Sinovac to produce COVID-19 vaccines. I would like to thank China for its great support and for opening wide cooperation with Chinese companies also for its work to empower Egypt to produce a Sinovac vaccine here in the country with full transfer of technology. An alliance of Egyptian companies led by government's vaccination arm Vexera will be producing the Chinese vaccine. The WHO is supporting Egypt to become a regional hub for manufacturing and distributing COVID-19 vaccines. A few weeks ago, the organization sent experts to evaluate Vaxera's production lines in preparation for the manufacture of the vaccines in Egypt and exporting the jab to African countries too. It approved the use of the factory to produce the vaccines. Egypt and China are finalizing the agreement and logistics to produce the Sinovac COVID-19 jab. 
Officials here say they are targeting to produce 80 million doses annually. We have the necessary expertise to produce and distribute vaccines. So transferring the technology of the COVID-19 vaccine from China to Egypt won't be hard. We can develop it in great quality because the technology of developing that vaccine is not so complicated. Reaching the 80 million doses target won't happen this year, but in later stages. In the beginning, the production will start in the government's Vaxera factory, which has a ready capacity of producing 20 million doses annually. New production lines will then be established to raise the output capacity to 40 million doses. It's a great push for Egypt's vaccination efforts. Egypt has only 1.5 million vaccines and it's targeting to vaccinate 100 million people. Cooperation in health matters between Egypt and China under the pandemic has been exemplary. Egypt was among the few nations in the world that conducted phase three human clinical trials for Chinese COVID-19 vaccines. When the jab became available for emergency use, Egypt became the first country in Africa to receive them. Producing Sinovac's COVID-19 vaccine will further deepen health ties with China, which the pandemic has greatly developed. The Egyptian government has not yet announced a date for when the vaccine production is set to begin. It is racing against time, however, to launch this landmark step for Africa in fighting the pandemic before the year ends. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Still on the business of vaccination, a shipment of Chinese-made Sinopharm COVID-19 vaccines has landed in Mauritius. Several dignitaries on hand to receive that donation, including the country's health minister, Dr. Kailesh Shagupal. According to him, the doses will be used in a national vaccination campaign. The minister says the shipment was an example of friendly ties between the two states. Gong Yifong, the charge affairs at the Chinese embassy in Mauritius, said China will continue to work with the country to deal with the pandemic. On to East Africa, Tanzania has bought three new aircraft. That's according to the country's Prime Minister, Kasim Majaliwa. The Prime Minister said the aircraft will bring the number of the planes in a government-owned carrier to a total of 12. CGTN's Daniel Kijo has the details. Air Tanzania is looking to take off as a serious player in East Africa's aviation game. The company suffered a turbulent time over the last few decades involving allegations of mismanagement and the loss of millions of dollars. The government under former President John Magufuli initiated a new drive to revive Air Tanzania Company Limited by acquiring brand new aircrafts. The government has completed the purchase of three new planes, two being Airbuses, two 20-300s and one Dash 8400. These planes will arrive during this year, 2021 to 2022. The government will now own the 12 aircrafts as previously planned. The turbulence looks set to continue, according to a Chief Auditor General report, which revealed losses of $25 million during the 2019-2020 financial year. Analysts say the airline business is a complex one and that across the globe, all major airlines are making losses. An aviation expert for 30 years, Mustafa Katao says aviation is a long-term game and that Air Tanzania has an opportunity to make profits. Uh, I can tell you there's huge scope for flights within Africa. Uh, we have two airlines which are dominating this market. Uh, Ethiopian Airlines and Kenya Airways are dominating the African market. Uh, previously, we had uh, South African Airways, which has uh, uh, suspended its operations. But I'm very much confident uh, that uh, Air Tanzania will do a turnaround in the next uh, three to five years. The government believes reviving Air Tanzania could be critical in promoting other economic sectors, including tourism, agriculture, fisheries and trade. In the early 1980s, Air Tanzania used to fly internationally to Dubai, Mumbai, Port Lewis, London and Moroni. The airline faced challenges in the mid-90s to the 2000s, but now the government is looking to use this upgraded fleet to position itself as a strong regional player in the next couple of years. 
This comes as some foreign airlines to the Kilimanjaro International Airport have resumed flights after recent suspensions following reduced traffic because of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Kenya Airways, Turkish Airlines and Germany-based Condor are also in talks to resume flights to the Kilimanjaro International Airport, Tanzania's gateway to the northern tourism circuit. Experts believe stabilizing the air transport industry will be key to the survival of the tourism sector. Tourism goes hand in hand with flights. Uh, it, it cannot say, you cannot separate this because people have to be brought from wherever they are. Uh, and the quickest, reliable way of bringing them to Tanzania counts a lot. Though President John Magufuli has passed away, his support for the aviation industry will likely continue under President Samia Sulu Hassan to the relief of the aviation industry. Daniel Kijo, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. We're 40 minutes into the hour. Time for another break. Here's what's coming up next. South Korea heads to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea over Japan's plans to release some nuclear wastewater. And the US climate envoy arrives in China for talks on how to limit global warming. This has taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. It's really exciting. <laughs> Over the last 14 hours of rain. Business in Africa is at a crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges, from grassroots to big businesses. Global Business takes you along for the ride as we track the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. to the program. These are some of the stories we're monitoring at this hour. The Africa CDC says it's closely monitoring reports on the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Both South Africa and the United States have suspended the use of this jab. The FDA suspended its use after six vaccine recipients developed some rather rare blood clots. Twenty nursery school children appear to have died after a fire broke out in this school. The authorities say that the pupils were among those who could not escape the fire that engulfed 21 classrooms built out of straw. The cause of the blaze is still unknown. The Prime Minister in the country visited a school in Yame's Pabe's district and condoled for the families of the deceased. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, at least 10 people have been killed, 34 others have been injured in two days of clashes between rival ethnic groups. The violence broke out in the eastern city of Goma during a protest held to denounce the killing of civilians. And South Sudan's government says it's working to speed up reforms in the country's security sector. This comes at a time when the UN mission in South Sudan has announced plans to reduce troop numbers by 7% next year. At the moment, there are 17,000 UN troops deployed there. 2,000 police officers are there as well in Africa's youngest country. That's a run through your headlines. Away from the continent, let's head over to South Korea. It says it will petition the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea over Japan's decision to release tons of treated, contaminated water into the ocean. The authorities in Seoul add they will relay their concerns to the International Atomic Energy Agency as well and will step up their own radiological measuring and monitoring. Joseph Kim has this report from Seoul. 
South Korea expressed serious concerns about Japan releasing contaminated water from the destroyed Fukushima nuclear plant into the sea. The government says the decision could impact the safety of the South Korean people and the surrounding environment. The government expresses strong regret over the Japanese government's decision to release contaminated water from the Fukushima nuclear station into the sea. Japan says the first release will take place in about two years and will meet international standards endorsed by the International Atomic Energy Agency. South Korea's foreign ministry responded by calling in Japan's ambassador to lodge a formal protest. Being one of Japan's closest neighbors, worries are mounting around South Korea, particularly from those in the fishing industry. It's irresponsible of Japan to make a unilateral decision. Discharging the wastewater could directly harm and have a direct impact on our bodies. I believe what Japan is doing is wrong. As a Korean, I'm worried because of how close we are. We were already concerned with radiation, but if they release the wastewater, it's going to further stoke fears. An alliance of more than two dozen civic groups are also protesting the decision. They say they'll do everything in their power to prevent what they call nuclear terrorism. There are still high amounts of radioactive material inside Fukushima's contaminated water, and tritium is a material that can be measured properly if it is released into the ocean. This would cause severe pollution. The South Korean government needs to consider banning all seafood from Japan. In addition, some analysts say Fukushima's waters contain significant amounts of other isotopes despite years of treatment. International and local environmental groups also question TEPCO's plans because there is a high level of distrust of the company following years of leaks, spills, malfunctioning equipment and safety breaches. And so the South Korean government is calling for the transparent disclosure and international verification of the treatment process, saying it will take every necessary measure to putting its people's safety first. Joseph Kim for CGTN, Seoul. The U.S. climate envoy John Kerry is set to visit China for talks on how to limit global warming. His trip is the first official visit to the country by an official from the new Biden administration. Now, the former Secretary of State will be meeting his Chinese counterpart in Shanghai. His visit comes ahead of President Biden's virtual climate summit next week, in which he is likely to outline the United States' goals for cutting emissions by 2030. Last year, the then-president, Donald Trump, took the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Agreement, the only country to quit the deal. It then rejoined under the Biden administration in February this year. Kerry is also set to visit South Korea later this week. Now, we spoke about cryptocurrencies a little earlier. This is, you could say, somewhat related. China's central bank says that the digital RMB trial will be expanded to more parts of the country. Authorities there started trialing their digital currency at the end of 2019 in three different cities, in Shenzhen, Suzhou and Chengdu, as well as in Xiaoyang, a new area, and some of the Beijing Winter Olympic Game venues. Now, the central bank has since then added six cities to the trial, including Shanghai and Hainan. This digital RMB trial includes offline payments like dining, transport and shopping. It can also be used online through an app. At the same time, China's digital currency trials have attracted a fair bit of attention around the world. Some officials across the pond in the United States worry this is an attempt to replace the dollar. CGTN's Michelle Vandenberg explains why this isn't the case and what the trial means for China and the rest of the planet. The Biden administration is stepping up scrutiny of China's plans for its digital yuan, with some officials concerned the move could kick off a long-term bid to topple the dollar as the world's dominant reserve currency. China's central bank has rolled out trial issuance of a digital yuan in multiple cities, making it the first major central bank to do so. A broader rollout is expected during the Winter Olympics next year. China has made it clear that the main intentions of the digital yuan are to replace banknotes and coins. To reduce the incentives to use cryptocurrencies, they're not used to evade U.S. sanctions. The PBOC has been working for years on the digital yuan, having set up a specialist research team in 2014. 
China's push for the greater international use of its currency is also not an attempt to have the yuan challenge or supplant the U.S. dollar as the world's major reserve currency. That's according to a Chinese central bank official. The internationalization of the RMB is a natural result of China's economic development and integration into global supply and industrial chains. As a manufacturing and trade powerhouse, China plans to continue opening up to the rest of the world and play a bigger role on the global stage. While doing so, China encourages market players to use the RMB. It can help Chinese companies to reduce exchange costs and avoid exchange rate risks. China's currency now makes up just over 2% of global foreign exchange reserves, compared with nearly 60% for the U.S. dollar. A recent Chinese central bank working paper has suggested to establish RMB currency futures market as a proper time, as it will facilitate mature risk management to accommodate the wider acceptance of RMB as an international currency. The process of RMB internationalization will be based on China's overall economy, opening up measures, and macro management capability and market conditions, and will happen naturally and steadily. The European Parliament has given a green light for two key committees to vote this week on the trade deal between the EU and the United Kingdom. A ratification by the European Parliament is the final step in clearing the trade and cooperation agreement struck between the two sides back in December. And the EU Parliament has until the end of the month to get this done. If it doesn't, and the provisional application of the agreement is not extended, then the trade deal effectively ceases to apply, which would leave the UK and the EU to trade on WTO terms with tariffs and quotas applying. Now, members of the EU Parliament suspended the voting process last month in protest against British changes to arrangements on Northern Ireland. A lawmaker said a full parliamentary vote will have to wait until there's progress on the implementation of the withdrawal agreement. Now, the luxury watch exhibition Watches and Wonders has gone back to Shanghai for the second time after making its debut last year. Global watch brands are showcasing their environmentally friendly designs this year. Chen Tong takes us on a tour of the exhibition. Welcome to the world of watches! Last year, the luxury watch exhibition Watches and Wonders came from Geneva to Shanghai for the very first time. And this year, it returned to the city's westbound again. And the theme of this year's exhibition is green. You ask me how green? So this one is made by uh, Apple Waste, and I can tell you it's actually very light. The strap very interesting because it, it's made of apple, apple waste, and all together this is a, a, a great watch and it will contribute to reduce uh, not only the carbon emission but also the consumption of energy. And some sustainable metals. 98.6% of our materials are environmental friendly. It's a breakthrough for the watch industry. Some expensive ones too. And this one, some 1 million yuan. This year, some 19 brands are showcasing their latest design and exhibition. The exhibition runs from April 14 to 18. So if you are a watch fan, please come to the Westbound and bring your credit card. All right, then a quick run through commodity prices. Let's start with gold. Bullion prices are continuing the decline, down 8.5% uh, so far this year, $1,737 a troy ounce is the number you're looking at at this point in time. Brent crude popped by at least 4% in trading today. An interesting development on the usual arranged um, cycle uh, as far as uh, regulated prices are concerned in East Africa and Kenya specifically. The authorities didn't move prices by that much, at least not by what had been expected. How do they pull it off? They essentially squeeze supply margins by a fair bit. We'll have a better breakdown for you on that in tomorrow's bulletin. Here's what's coming up tonight. Environmentalists hinted more economic opportunities in South Africa's waste management sector. Details coming up next.
let's head over to South Africa. The focus over there once again is on reducing the dumping of waste at landfills. Although there's been some progress over the years in converting plastics and paper back into raw materials, just 10% of waste that ends up in a landfill is usually recycled. Environmentalists in the country say it could increase economic opportunities available if a lot more recycling was happening. Here's CGTN's Julie Shire with this report. Industrial recycling rates in South Africa have slumped after several lockdowns. Worryingly, waste management companies have also noticed a spike in single-use plastics. Globally, there's a big, a big drive. You see no shopping bags and no stores. A, a big awareness campaign to reduce single-use plastics because they have such a dire impact on our environment. But with COVID, the rise in PPE, your masks, and all your different types of plastics covering um, material, we've seen a rise in single-use plastic, which is, is not good. South Africa produced around 1.8 million tons of plastic in 2019. Just half a million tons was recycled during that time of which 70% was converted back to raw materials. That may soon increase as government gets tough on rubbish disposal. We have a new regulation coming in specifically around packaging, which will affect the direct recycling market, the extended producer responsibility regulation, which says producers of, of materials or products that are packaged need to take more onus on what happens to those products after the consumer has used those. South Africa's recycling rates are still very low, over 90% of waste is still dumped in landfills. A billion dollars worth of waste last year was thrown away to landfill, which are actually resources which could have been used into our economy. And in the sense of where South Africa is in terms of economy, those are valuable resources that we could have not only used, but also created jobs. Waste collectors are vital to South Africa's economy. It's estimated they save municipalities $50 million in landfill space annually. I'm next to the retails and whatsoever, so, so cardboard is the one that do well, and the more of aluminum can. Aluminum can, as you can see, I'm around the pubs, yes, and the garages next to me, corporates, and now at least they turn it to be a recyclable material, they can do something and they can send to the end user, they do the product. South Africa is under pressure to increase recycling as landfill space fast diminishes, but municipal solid waste comes from households. But consumers can start helping by separating their trash before dumping it in the bin. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. All right, then a run through the currencies as we wrap up the program. The Rand's good run of form does continue essentially unabated. It's hitting a high so far this year, 14.39 to the dollar. At those levels, it's clawed back about 2% against the greenback. Uh, Bitcoin bid pullback from highest hit earlier today, over $64,600 uh, on Bitcoin, down about four tenths of a percent to under 63 dollars thousand dollars and a quick update of course on coinbase uh, as trading does continue it did go as high at one point it's 429 dollars uh, a share it's pulled back a fair bit from then uh, but still even at 351 dollars a share it's up at least 40 percent that's it for this edition of global business africa as always we'd like to hear your thoughts on the content you've seen on the program in the course of this hour in many ways you get your thoughts back to us all of them on your screens right now I'm Raman Yang in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Thank you for your company in the last.